things. Okay. Lovely to see many of you who have come to prior sessions during the summit. For those of you who I've not met before, I'm Dr. Tia Rich, and I have the pleasure of directing the Contemplation by Design Summit. This year, we are fortunate to have tonight's speaker, Professor Lake Vermeule. She's also the chair of the Stanford English Department. And I learned of her wisdom when her book, Action Versus Contemplation, was featured in a Stanford Report news article. I reached out to her, and she kindly agreed to share her insights and some of her uh, content from her book in this year's summit. As many of you know, one of the gifts of a true teacher is the ability to address age-old problems that humanity faces in language and in terms that speak to the present moment and to the current situation. And from what I have experienced of Professor Vermeule, that is her gift. So without further ado, let's give her a warm welcome for her session tonight, and I give her a small gift of gratitude. Oh, thank you. That's so, so kind. That she can enjoy a cup of tea. Oh, <laughs> excellent. That's lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's very kind. Hello, everybody. I'm very, very pleased and uh, really happy to be here with you all tonight. Um, I have been thinking about uh, the question of action and contemplation for a very long time, in part uh, because my friend Jennifer Summit um, and I taught for many years a, a class here at Stanford on, on this question. It was a freshman class. It was taught under the auspices of, of IHUM. Uh, and um, thanks to Ellen Woods, who made it um, possible for us to explore these questions. And when we were done teaching the class, I think we taught it all together for about four years, uh, we really felt that we hadn't quite <laughs> understood um, the topic because ultimately it's so deep and so connected to the history of Western philosophy that we wanted to try to write a book that would help us explore a little bit some of the questions. And really uh, what we discovered um, is that this question of, of action and contemplation goes right back to the very beginning of Western thought. Um, so, I'm going to read you a few passages from the book, um, and then I'd like us to maybe open up the floor for, for discussion. So I'll start with the introduction. Once upon a time, there were some ants. They gathered food all summer and laid up stores for the winter. The ants were small, but they worked together so that everyone would have enough for the long season ahead. Meanwhile, their neighbor, the grasshopper, spent the summer hopping around in the sun. Winter is coming, they warned him. You'd better prepare. The grasshopper just laughed. I live in the moment. You should stop to enjoy life too, rather than wasting it in mindless work. But the ants just worked harder. When winter came, the ants settled in with their supplies, and the grasshopper had nothing. Hungry and cold, he turned to his neighbors for help, but they had only enough for themselves and nothing to spare. In the summer, it looked like we were wasting our lives, the ants told him. Now you know that we were saving them. Once upon a time, there were some ants who spent the fine summer of their short and precious lives toiling in Pharaoh's army, marching robotically to the monotonous beat of the same tinny drum, unable to think for themselves, much less to suck the marrow out of life. They worshipped such, such dreary neoliberal quasi-virtues as efficiency, outcomes, best practices, and the corporate ethos. 
They hired consultants and they put stopwatches on the shop floor. The grasshopper was appalled. Nobody in Ant World ever seemed to have a free moment to think or to reflect, much less to play or to enjoy. Efficient they might be, but they were hardly creative and far from happy. As for laying up stores for the winter, surely, thought the grasshopper, it is better to be happy now and to play catch as catch can later. Some stories work their way into the collective consciousness and they never really work their way out again. The Ant and the Grasshopper is a story that comes to us from antiquity. Yet these characters are hardly just uh, characters in an agrarian table about, tale about the need to be prudent during times of feast in anticipation of coming famine. A story that would have made much more sense to our chronically hungry ancestors than to our overfed selves. Rather, they represent, in the words of William Blake, two contrary states of the soul. The ant and the grasshopper personify traits possessed by all people. The urge to step back, to consider the shortness of our lives and the smallness and our smallness in the cosmos, to experience life rather than to waste it, versus the need to act in the service of the greater good, to contribute to something bigger than ourselves, to help others endure the struggles that we all share. I think most of us experience both impulses regularly, sometimes in conflict, sometimes intertwined. Yet the way we now understand this story, it's, it's come down to us as a kind of harsh moral fable. So you either live like an ant or you die like a grasshopper. You work for the future or you find yourself in a desperate pass. The choice is starkly clear. In my lived experience, by contrast, it is downright murky. I aspire, often not successfully, to finding grasshopper-like enjoyment and fulfillment in my daily work. And even the most ant-like among us can't easily square the ant's virtuous work ethic with their coldness and lack of charity. Yet, I think as children, we learn to see work and pleasure through the divisive lens of either or. The story of the ant and the grasshopper has woven itself so tightly into the fabric of the modern Western mind. Around this fable cluster many of our culture's most pressing myths, conversations, and collective freakouts. I don't know if you remember, there was a, a moment about 10 years ago when um, a law professor at Yale named Amy Chua published a book called The Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. Um, this was a, um, this, this was a uh, very famous book. Um, and the, 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 there was a sort of collective howl that went up coast to coast when, when her book was published. Um, she more or less claimed uh, in her book um, that, that Asian children are more successful than other children because non-Asian and especially white parents indulge their children rather than teaching them discipline. So this fable concerns itself rather primally with character development, which is central to child rearing, two areas flooded by rivers of advice, much of it quite harsh and moralizing and scary. In this book, my co-author and I try not to offer any advice. Uh, instead, we offer a larger intellectual context for these two contrary states of the soul, and the issues that this fable, it's a, to my mind, it's a living, still a very living fable, brings to life. And this context uh, is the ancient debate between the active life and the contemplative life. To the extent that this debate goes back into the, the roots of Western philosophy, it's concerned with certain core questions. Which is more valuable, knowledge or action? Which is the greater achievement, wisdom, or material success? 
which is best a life of active accomplishment or a life of spiritual or intellectual contemplation? Are action and contemplation necessarily at odds? Or can we hope to achieve a balance between them? These questions have been debated and refined in the works of the world's great thinkers, Plato and Aristotle, Shakespeare and Thoreau, George Eliot and Hannah Arendt, but they are still intimately and uncomfortably familiar to all of us, to our students as they choose courses, declare fields of study and attempt to chart their own paths, um, and also to ourselves. Um, my coworker and I have found ourselves being asked about the action contemplation debate on and off campus by friends, by colleagues, alumni and family, people who felt that it described some acute conflicts in their own lives. We experienced such tensions ourselves. When we first taught the course, we were two newly tenured literature professors at Stanford with plentiful resources, a position about as close to the contemplative vocation as modern capitalism allows. Yet along with the freedom to contemplate, the security of tenure bought to both of us a sense of responsibility to act, to confront questions that had become increasingly uncomfortable for both of us. We saw over the course of the time that we were teaching this course, and, and even more especially since 2008, since the financial um, collapse, we saw fewer and fewer students choosing to major in other in the humanities, and we wondered how we could articulate the value of these seemingly impractical fields, or if we should, given the insecure workplace our, our PhD students faced. Um, but I think where we came to is the idea that we were convinced that this question is too vital to be confined to the archives or to the classroom. It really is a topic that is, is limitless. It ha there's no fixed point on which it rests. Um, probably the most striking thing about this debate is that it never should have started. Arist Aristotle sort of tried to end it uh, before it began. Um, those of you who, uh, who enjoy classical philosophy, um, you might go back and take a look at Aristotle's defense of contemplation in the Nicomachean Ethics. It's absolutely beautiful. It's a beautiful work. He says directly and clearly that contemplation the Greek word is theoria, theoria, is the highest state of human flourishing, eudaimonia. Contemplation is the highest human good because it is self-sufficient, continuous. We are more capable of continuous study than of any other sort of activity and complete on its own. Unlike most actions we undertake, contemplation aims at no end beyond itself. We do it for its own sake. Therefore, it is the most perfect of the virtues and the most conducive to happiness. So, why don't we all practice it? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'd like to take up a, a question that I think about a great deal, which, uh, so I, um, I spend a, a lot of time thinking about and studying human cognition and especially human cognitive biases. This is something that I've um, sort of made, made the center of my scholarly career. And what I'm fascinated by is how modern market society and corporate capitalism engages in what we might call bias capture. So um, it, it's, uh, it, it's not a secret to anybody in this room that uh, Modern market society strongly encourages utilitarian calculation and it demands technocratic efficiency. So uh, contemporary post-industrial capitalist societies more or less ask us to treat other people as means to an end rather than as ends in themselves. Um, there's an Italian 
psychiatrist whose work I really like. He writes um, very movingly on the power of kindness. And he says that we're now in a global ice age of kindness and compassion. Uh, it's a sort of post-industrial ice age um, for, for complicated reasons involving industrialization and so forth. Um, but the, the question that has been sort of at the heart of this debate um, is uh, how do we fashion selves, selves that we can admire and can live with when we are more or less asked by our economic conditions to treat other people as instruments? How much of this mindset is an illusion? Uh, and how do we, in a way, get to terms with the fact that the modern world plays tricks on many of our intuitions, often in ways that harm us? So we know this. Um, we know, for instance, that we crave sugar because of ecological constraints faced by our ancestors, yet sugar in the modern world is in uh, oversupply. Uh, as empty calories become cheaper to produce than nutrient-rich foods, obesity swells into a global epidemic. Um, so I think that there's uh, a sort of related what we might call um, bias capture uh, in the modern world. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Uh, and I'm going to call it um, the, the action bias. So. Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll pause here and see if there are any comments or questions before I get into the sort of technical piece of my, um, my presentation. Does anybody? Yes, go ahead. Okay, well, yes, could you say bias capture in simpler words? Well, I think what I, what I mean is that, um, so, uh, I, well, maybe I'll, um, let me see if I can, so I think it, uh, it is now um, clear to many psychologists that we have uh, what might amount to um, certain kinds of evolved cognitive traits. And these evolved cognitive traits uh, evolved in a, in a world very different from the one in which we now live. Often uh, the, the modern world is at odds with uh, the, the traits as they evolved uh, in what we might call our ancestral past. So if we think about our craving for sugar, that's a very good example of um, a, a trait that served us extremely well um, at certain points in our past, but doesn't necessarily serve us well so well now. So what I'm going to talk about uh, is what I call the action bias. And I think that this is such a, it's by analogy to the case of sugar. Um, I think that the modern world encourages uh, a bias or a sort of feature of our cognitions that um, might have served us well in the past, but that now actually uh, ma makes it easy for us to feel somewhat um, alienated from our surroundings. So, so here, yes, go ahead, go ahead. I think that action bias, the bias towards action, is, um, and it's actually a, a sort of a series of kinds of cognitive biases, um, uh, is, um, is, a, is an instance of bias capture by the modern world. So I think uh, what I'm going to say is going to sound very pessimistic, but I don't mean it to. Um, I, I think the more we're sort of aware of our predicament, the more we're aware of our condition, um, the, the easier it is maybe to try to uh, help ourselves out of it. So, um, 
Here's a terrible paradox. The less certain we find ourselves, the more we crave certainty and control. And the more we crave certainty, the more we try to take matters into our own hands. This, my interest in this topic actually began, uh, I'm a soccer fan, I love, um, I love the Premier League, I love watching uh, soccer, I always have my whole life, and I've always been interested in the case of elite soccer goalkeepers. So if you're a soccer fan like I am, you actually, there's something that you dread more than anything else, and that's penalty shootouts, which are used to break ties, often in important games with vast amounts of money and prestige at stake. So opposing goalkeepers each face a series of kickers and are most often humiliated. The kicker stands 36 feet away and fires the ball at speeds up to 80 miles an hour towards a net 24 feet wide. The goalkeeper has only two tenths of a second to work out what to do and usually has to commit himself before the kick is launched. But even with these many advantages, kickers sometimes miss or have their shots blocked. When that happens, the shame can linger for decades. To save everybody a great deal of pain, the referee should probably just let the match be decided by a coin toss. But games we know are not rational. They often fail, as economists delicately put it, to maximize their own utility. So in 2007, a team of Israeli behavioral economists published a paper about how elite goalkeepers defend against penalty kicks. This is a sort of fascinating question. How do you deal with this situation? Goalkeepers, they showed, are often their own worst enemies. They make a difficult task even harder by trying to do something, anything, to solve it. The economist's findings were written up uh, in, in, many, many different, um, uh, in many different venues. Uh, but what they more or less discovered is that goalkeepers would actually have the best chance of stopping a penalty kick if they did nothing, if they just stood right in the center of the goal uh, and just waited for the kick to come. But in fact, most goalies don't do that. Um, often before they see the kick coming, they, they lunge to the left or to the right, which makes their chances of stopping the ball worse. When asked, most goalies actually reported feeling worse about missing penalty kicks when they just stood, stood there than when they lunged to one side or another. If they were going to fail, they said it's better to go down doing something than standing still and looking weak. Yet in the end, they end up worse off than if they had done nothing. So this is something that social scientists call action bias. Now the, the action part of it is interesting, but I wanna spend a moment talking about the word bias. Uh, this is a word that means something very specific uh, in social psychology. Um, we all know that compared to computers, humans are notoriously bad at reasoning. We often uh, take quick and easy mental shortcuts, um, but not just quick and easy, uh, often false. Our mental shortcuts tend to be self-serving and overly optimistic. These shortcuts uh, are called cognitive biases, and they can be very, very hard to understand or to correct. Uh, the systematic study of cognitive biases began really in Israel in the 1960s, when two young researchers, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, started asking questions about how people reason. Their research program over the past several decades has yielded enormous fruit. They invented a new academic field. They turned out new research agendas across the social sciences, and Kahneman uh, garnered a Nobel Prize in economics. Tversky, who was a Stanford professor, having died some years before. So there are many, many examples of such biases. But I'm very interested in the question of how biases sort of fare uh, in, in the modern world. And there's actually one bias, cognitive bias, that stands out above the rest and indeed I think explains 
why so many other biases are common, and this is, the, this is called the illusion of control. So this was first identified by a Harvard professor named Ellen Langer in 1975, and it's the tendency, as she put it somewhat dryly, uh, to, quote, assume a skill orientation in chance situations. So her example is that in a casino, People behave as though furrowing their brows, blowing into their hands, or throwing extra hard or soft will make the dice roll go their way. In sports, uh, if you're a sports fan, the illusion of control can lead to some funny rituals. Pitchers often go through an elaborate set routine before pitching, pinching the, ri r uh, the rosin bag, running their toe just so over the pitching rubber or touching parts of their uniform in sequence. Wade Boggs, the great Red Sox third baseman, ate chicken before every game, and whole websites chronicle the quirks and superstitions of professional athletes, including Serena Williams, who is said to wear the same pair of socks throughout a tournament. Well, it turns out that this illusion of, this, uh, illusion of control um, is actually more prevalent uh, when we feel uh, when we feel lost, when, when we feel at sea. So the less control we have in a situation, the more likely we are to seek to stabilize the world around us by engaging in this cognitive bias. Uh, the anthropologist Bruno Malinowski discovered, uh, this was a, a famous discovery, that uh, tribes of the Trobriand Islands who fish in the deep sea where sudden storms and unmapped waters are constant concerns, have far more rituals associated with fishing than do those who fish in shallow waters. The illusion of control is a really profound way that we have of trying to impose order onto a world that seems chaotic, scary, or out of control. And actually, many, many social psychologists have uh, have um, done experiments that have repeated these findings. Um, so some of my sort of favorite ones involve uh, researchers asking people to find patterns in pictures from which computers had eliminated any trace of anything like a pattern or an embedded image. Uh, and, and in those experiments, the less control people had over their performance on the task, the more likely they were to see patterns where none existed. They were also more likely to find conspiracies in stories, and when told that the stock market was volatile, to overestimate the amount of negative information available about fictional companies. So what over and over and over again, social psychologists have, have shown us that uh, experiencing a loss of control leads people to desire more structure and to per perceive illusory patterns in uh, patternless states. So even exposure to absurdist art can have this effect. One study found that participants who were exposed to absurdist art uh, or even reminders of our own mortality in the form of stories by Kafka or Monty Python uh, reported higher scores on the personal need for structure scale, suggesting that they experienced a heightened need for meaning. I think, um, so one of the arguments of, of this book, or one of the, the things that we try to, to diagnose in this book, is uh, that, sure, pattern-seeking and ritual behavior seem harmless enough if they're triggered in experimental con conditions, However, uh, the illusion of control can actually feed intuition so strong that their grip is devilishly hard to break. Uh, most people feel safer, and I'm sure you've heard some of these studies, uh, if they are directly in control, yet it's actually much safer to fly on a jet that's piloted by somebody else than it is to drive to the airport. Um, the whole industries, uh, including, I believe, the gun lobby, uh, and certain car makers have notoriously exploited this intuition to our collective de 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 detriment. So um, many people keep guns at home because they feel that guns protect their families from intruders, but the reverse is actually true. 
bringing a gun into the house is the fastest way to put your family and children at risk. So rates of suicide, homicide, and accidental deaths spike dramatically if there are firearms uh, in the house. Uh, as Matthew Miller, a Harvard epidemiologist, put it, if you bought a gun today, I could tell you the risk of suicide to you and your family members is going to be two to tenfold higher over the next 20 years. There are not many things you can do to increase your risk of dying tenfold. So too with SUV ownership in the 1990s, uh, advertising campaigns relentlessly stoked the idea uh, that uh, we were most threatened by other drivers and by foul weather, hostile forces outside ourselves, but uh, people could thus sort of ignore data about rollover risks. Uh, I, I, so, so one of the, the things that I'm really fascinated by is how contemporary market capitalism actually exploits this, this feeling of needing to do something, of needing to con try to control uh, our environment uh, in ways that actually make us worse off. So that's the pessimistic part of the talk. Um, maybe I'll stop here and see if you have any questions about this, and then I'm going to turn to an optimistic ending. Um, at least I, I think it's optimistic. I hope I haven't bummed you out. Um, yeah. So if I understand correctly, the thrust of your remarks is that contemplation is better than action. Um, well, so far the thrust of my remarks have been that um, c that contemporary market society pushes us in all kinds of ways to believe that action is superior to contemplation and actually does so in part uh, by what we might call harvesting certain cognitive biases that we have in favor of doing things um, and in favor of acting. Um, so I uh, have, have long been interested in this um, in this question of actually uh, does doing does doing something um, well let me put it this way that that um, um, I, I'm not entirely sure at this point in my life that uh, that doing things um, or what we might call the per pervasive ideology of solutionism uh, in American capitalism, and especially in Silicon Valley, actually makes us better off. So, but my bias, I, I should tell you, is that it's true that I am a longtime contemplative, uh, and I try uh, very, very hard to fight against this tendency in myself because I really recognize it, and I recognize that so many of our sort of um, consumerist conditions are pushing us constantly to to solve this, solve that, do this, do that. Um, and I think, that, I think that the analogy in my mind is to our consumption of sugar. So that's the case that I'm trying to make. But yeah. on the other hand, if one looks at the history of civilization, yeah. just pure contemplation or speculation can, can lead to basically being dead ends. And scientific method requires this experiment, which is a kind of action. Yeah. Feeling that too much contemplation can lead to paralysis and there's nothing to address serious yeah. suffering. Do you want to? Um, so, uh, I'm a humanist <laughs> and an academic, and I have uh, heard this my whole life. Um, this, this view goes all the way back to Plato. It's very, very ancient. The view that uh, philosophy, contemplation, reflection, inwardness uh, is something that is really, um, it's, it's useless and sometimes worse than useless. That it's something that uh, is okay for children, but not for adults. That really the sort of mature human personality needs to be 
the, the sort of the man of action, uh, the, the sort of the person uh, engaged in debate uh, in the marketplace. In fact, there's a really wonderful example of this um, way of thinking in a, a dialogue of Plato's called the Gorgias. And there's a character named Callicles who more or less just comes out and says to Socrates, I don't understand why you're such a baby. You know, you stand around philosophizing. That's something for babies. Really, um, really it's, you know, if you're going to be a, a, a mature person, you can't spend time being a contemplative. And I think that I think that that's one of the really fascinating features of this ancient debate, uh, is that it provokes this kind of vehemence on both sides. So, so that's the point of view of Callicles, and then there's the point of view of Aristotle that says, no, actually, uh, rational self-ordering through reflection, through contemplation, is the highest human good. And that tradition gets picked up over and over and over again uh, in the West, including by um, lots and lots of different writers that I study, uh, John Milton, um, but also psychoanalysis, and it's not just in the West, it's in Buddhism too, the idea that actually uh, the, the, the act of ordering yourself through reason and through reflection is a lifetime pursuit. Um, and so um, my bias, I'll tell you, is in favor of that point of view. I think that, that, I think that it's right. Uh, but at this point in my life, I don't see that there's a lot of support from our culture for this way of looking at things. In fact, I meet people all the time who um, have more or less stumbled onto the Aristotelian path by accident. Um, they, they come to understand, uh, as Aristotle said, that actually reflection and uh, inwardness can be an enormous source of rational self-ordering. But they come to understand it almost by accident, and they come to understand it through uh, a sort of pursuit of many different kinds of paths. Uh, the people that I talk to who've come to this point of view are often extremely successful scientists or, or business people, um, but they're, uh, it's almost like when they, when they discover the idea of the contemplative path, um, they, they, they are doing so without any sort of cultural support. Um, and, and it seems to me that they, they sort of, it's like they're coming out of the woods like mad people. It's like, well, we've discovered this secret. Well, look, it's over here. Aristotle said that, you know, this was the, this was the way to go. So, um, so I, think it's a, I think it's a constant struggle in our culture. I mean, and, and certainly the contempt for the contemplative is massive. I mean, you don't have to go very far to, to find, you don't have to go back to Plato, certainly, to find um, the idea that, uh, that people who want to spend their lives in a, in a sort of um, pursuit of wisdom are just silly. Like, why, why would you do that? Um, so I, I think that that's the way I would answer the question. Um, yeah. Yeah. To break that, it's okay then to act. Be biased to action, but come with a very good alignment between your values, your thoughts. Yep. Yeah. So this is what I want to get to um, here is uh, the, the the strain in in uh, Western thought um, that has to do with how to bring action and contemplation together. So I'll, I'll sort of end with that, because I think it's actually, um, th there's a long tradition of people trying to sort of tell us how to do it, um, or how, how they have done it. Uh, and and I, think it's, I think it's fascinating. So um, <clears throat> I'll start with actually uh, a writer who I love very much, Fran Franz Kafka. Um, in, in 1913, Kafka was working at an office job at the Workers' Accident Insurance uh, Institute in his native city of Prague, and he was struggling desperately to find time to write stories. His effort was enormous, and so was the toll on his psychic life. He worked in the office from early morning until mid-afternoon, then he napped. He did 10 minutes of exercises and had dinner with his youngest sisters, and finally, at 10.30, 
but often not until 11 I sit down to write and go on depending on my strength, inclination, and luck until 1, 2, or 3 o'clock, once even till 6 in the morning, and then again more exercise then a wash, and then usually with a slight pain in my heart and twitching stomach muscles to bed. Um, so he really struggled and suffered during this period of his life, and his diary, diary entries grow increasingly forlorn. He, he writes angst, neurasthenia, and so forth and so on, until all of a sudden he had a kind of a breakthrough, and he wrote several stories uh, in the space of three months, including the metamorphosis. And when he did so, he wrote this entry in his diary. He said, the tremendous world I have inside my head, but how to free myself and how to free it without being torn to pieces. And a thousand times I'd rather be torn to pieces than to retain it in me or bury it. That indeed is why I'm here. That is quite clear to me. So I'm fascinated by by this. And writers often refer to the tremendous worlds inside their heads, worlds that are sometimes more vivid, more colorful, and present to them than the world outside. Um, so this is a very, very ancient belief that writers have. They've called this inner world a garden, a tract to till and to cultivate. They've called it an ocean. Kafka famously called it a frozen sea. He said a book must be an axe for the frozen sea inside us, I believe that. Uh, they've called it heaven and hell. Uh, the, the, but, but deep in the sort of, the, if, you, if you sort of trace this idea out in the history of, of uh, Western writing, there's the idea that the mind is a vast and, and separate space that we can fruitfully explore. And it's really, the, the exploration of it is central to art central to literature, central to psychoanalysis, and now I think central, what's interesting to me is it's, it's central to the conversion of neuroscience and mindfulness practice. So there's a term mind sight that comes from an emerging field in neuroscience. There's a fellow named Daniel Siegel uh, who's written several books about this topic. But like uh, uh, Henry Thoreau and many others, he, he argues that mind sight, namely the capacity to become consciously aware of our own inner landscape is actually a practice that can be cultivated. Uh, it's, he says it's, a, it's the basic skill uh, that, that underlies everything we mean when we speak of having social and emotional intelligence. Long before neuroscientists developed this approach, writers were passionate advocates for mind sight. Thoreau obsessively observed his inner landscape the poet, he said, must be continually watching the moods of his mind as the astronomer watches the aspects of the heavens. Rather than traveling to catalog the natural world, we would do well to stay home and study the universe inside. This practice is almost deeply, almost existentially democratic. Thoughts are thoughts. They are equally powerful, equally worthy of study, no matter whose mind they happen to light upon. A meteorological journal of the mind, says Thoreau, you shall observe what occurs in your latitude, I in mine. Thoreau's friend and mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson, made a lifetime study of this inner landscape, or what he called the discrepance between his inner landscape and the outer world. So he tells us repeatedly how important this is to him. But, you know, like Plato and Kant, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of idealist philosophers, including Emerson, who believe that our real life lies beyond outer experience. Only the inner world touches on this real life, which Emerson thought came from the mind of God, as these transcend transcendentalists did. So the outer world is tricky and slippery, um, but the inner world is, is, is the real world. Uh, and, and this tradition goes all the way back um, again to, uh, to the ancient world. So deep in writer's bones lurks the belief that in order to flourish, in order to be true, in order to be right, action needs to put down its roots into the inner life. The inner lives of writers may be crowded, colorful, messy, 
and vital as a street fair on a sunny afternoon, but many writers argue that the key to acting well and effectively lies here, inside the carnival. Effective action is like an engine. The inner world is the crankshaft. If the pistons aren't attached, the cylinders cannot fire. If we don't have access to our interiority, we will not have the capacity to act. Unless we take a good long look around inside, and I really believe this, I, so this is, um, I, I'm just gonna stand by this view because I think it's true. Artists tell us over and over and over again, our actions are going to be deformed. Um, so sometimes writers can assert this belief merely by arching an eyebrow at somebody whose actions have rather famously gone off the rails. After her husband died, Joan Didion came across a booklet from his Princeton class called Lives of 1954. One entry was from Donald H. Rummy Rumsfeld who noted, after Princeton, the years seem like a blur, but the days seem more like rapid fire. Joan Didion writes, I thought about this. I thought about this. The writer's response to the man of action the moralist's response to the wayward warrior, go inside and look around or your aim will be off. I'm going to end with an image. It's a beautiful image uh, for me from the writer Annie Dillard, who is a contemporary follower of Thoreau. Um, and to me, it, it stands as the kind of living, living uh, answer um, to, to, the, to the sort of questions posed by the ancient debate between the active and the contemplative life. So Dillard uh, has described her own writing as a living instrument that makes its own path by the very act of traveling down it. It's a path made by walking. Uh, and to me, this image could stand for the path that the contemplative person carves out for herself or himself a box canyon at the end of the path, not clear, but we attend. And here's what she writes. When you write, you lay out a line of words. The line of words is a miner's pick, a woodcarver's gouge, a surgeon's probe. You wield it, and it digs the path that you follow. Soon you find yourself deep in new territory. Is it a dead end? Or have you located the real subject? You will know tomorrow or this time next year. You make the path boldly and follow it fearfully. You go where the path leads. At the end of the path, you find a box canyon. You hammer out reports, dispatch bulletins. The writing has changed in your hands and in a twinkling from an expression of your notions to an epistemological tool. The new place interests you because it is not clear you attend. So I'm going to stop there and open up the floor and see if anybody has any questions. I have a question. Yep. With these insights, what have you found the conversation to be about higher education's respect of the cultivation of the contemplative ability to anchor and ground and guide the intellectual knowledge that may be learned in an institution of higher education? It's a wonderful question, and it's one that I struggle with every day, every week, every year as a humanist at Stanford. Um, as it, it's no secret to all of you that this is probably the, the, the great question um, of our time. Uh, and I don't have any answers. Do I just, I struggle. Or do you feel somewhat um, in a small, small voice? Um, I, I, so uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a massively important conversation. I think it's one that I hear going on all around me, not necessarily in the terms laid out by these philosophers, but the conversation is there all the same. And it's the question of, um, how do I fashion a self that I can live with in a market world, in, in a world that asks me more or less to treat other people as, as, means, as, as means rather than as ends, um, as instruments rather than as 
full selves. And I think that this conversation is constant. I hear a tremendous amount of anxiety about it. I think it's the, I think it's the conversation of our moment. Um, and I don't have any answers to it, uh, but, I, but I listen to it. I listen to it all the time, as, I, as I'm sure you do too. Um, yeah. Erotic self-deprecating? Oh, oh, neurotic self-deprecating. Yeah. I, so to me, one of the wonderful things about um, about spending time with with artists is that uh, they are so honest about their antisocial impulses, including the kind of crap that is in our heads all the time. So one of the writers that I revere is William Wordsworth, and he. <laughs> He's a great poet in part because he's willing to mine all of, the, all of the stuff that goes on in his head that is just trivial, nasty, uh, you know, sort of um, sexually domineering, uh, unpleasant, uninteresting to other people, uh, and just kind of bad. But he's willing to go there. And I think that actually that's one of the great gifts that that great artists can give us is a willingness to say, yeah, I have tremendous antisocial impulses. I have all kinds of stuff in my head and in my mind that I'm really uncomfortable with. But actually, the, the, gift, of, the gift of mind sight or the gift of looking inward is being able to sit with that stuff and not being afraid of it or not feeling like you have to pretend it isn't there. Um, it's true that many art artists are kind of eccentric. But actually, there's, there's, there's studies that show that, that eccentric people live longer um, and, and live happier than, than other people, in part because they're just kind of willing to, I mean, look, all of us have stuff going on in our heads all the time that we wouldn't necessarily want other people to know about that is either just silly or trivial or stupid or bad or, you know, um, ugly. And yet the, the willingness to really be comfortable with that, I think, is is one of the is one of the gifts of this uh, of this artistic contemplative tradition that that I am have been studying and I'm interested in. I don't know if that sort of answers your question, but yeah, the the stuff that the the meteorological journal of your mind, as Thoreau puts it, isn't isn't going to be all you know beautiful sunsets, right? Um, there's there's going to be stuff in there that's actually kind of kind of nasty. Um, yep. 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 The soullessness within these companies in Silicon Valley. And so, what is being done to bridge that conversation or to insert even a bit of this conversation into the business school curriculum? Because even for the guest speakers that we have come in, kind of Lisa Rice or, uh, and, and, uh, and then um, Eric Schmidt from Google, they come yep. in and they just tell the students, us, like, it's about action, acting fast, or quickly, if you have an emotion, bring it out. So we can there's no, there's no break at all in the business momentum, and you're only rewarded for speed of decisiveness. So I feel that there's zero percent of that content that mentioned on this. Yep. Well, 
I mean, th there's no question that we're talking about the higher echelons of American capitalism. And the higher echelons of American capitalism are enormously successful at doing what they do best, which is making money. And so um, making products that, that people want to use and making money. Um, th these companies aren't, they're not trying to, they're not worried about the, the question of how we fashion ourselves in a market world so that we can actually um, live with ourselves. That's, that's not the question that they're interested in. Um, but if they were going to ask me about that question, what I would say is that you know uh, um, autonomy is the is the master value of of the modern world. Um, and if you talk about people on the left, liberals, um, autonomy of person is the master value. And if you talk about people on the right, uh, conservatives, autonomy of contract is the master value. There, so. American uh, liberalism, corporate capitalism, worships autonomy. Um, and autonomy has some wonderful virtues to it, but it also uh, can be enormously enervating. It can lead to a tremendous sense of disconnection, distress, uh, a, sort, a sort of lack of uh, community. And I think that um, well, I think we're we're sort of seeing the, the consequences of that uh, now in um, in our in our political life. So, uh, so, um, so so given that autonomy is the master virtue or the master value, and in some ways the only value, how do we um, how do we try to orient ourselves in in relation to that? And I think that that's really the the question that you're asking, um, and it's a very profound question. Um, Mm -hmm. The executives of Uber were largely like going to do inaction on what should like so even for the echelons of capitalism, it didn't have to be the bottom line. And so I think that that is a gap in the conversation is that we're not trained to handle these situations. No. Stanford's producing leaders that don't know how to handle this. And I'm speaking for myself where I don't know how to handle some of these situations. And I feel that this conversation yeah, I mean, to, um, so I don't have an answer to that question because I'm an English professor and a harmless drudge. I'm not a titan of capitalism, but I do watch and I do care a lot about our culture. Um, what I would say is that to, to me, uh, when the Dalai Lama says that uh, kindness is my religion, that that actually does a lot of work. Um, in, in, this in this kind of question. So I'll just sort of leave, leave that there. Yeah. Uh, I want to add that your reference to Mindsight and Dan Siegel's work is a resource that you, oh, reference that you may want to explore. Yeah, I think Dan Siegel's work is amazing, actually. And, and what's so incredible about it is that it is so close to the work of all of these other artists, writers, philosophers, going back to the ancients who have come to the same conclusion without the, the benefit of his neuroscientific training. Yep. Um, I study computer science. Yep. Um, 
so it's a it's a good question. I don't have I don't have a normative answer. I'm not uh, I'm not interested, frankly, in um, I, I'm interested in in showing people what's out there and not in some ways demanding that they go and look. So I think that um, I, you know, I, I'm not somebody who really believes that, uh, that, that Stanford or other kinds of universities need to be um, uh, d demanding that, that people take humanities classes. I'm just not. I, th I think that people are, my, I mean, I know from my own life that I'm much more inclined to be interested in stuff that I go and, and find on my own um, rather than that I go and find through a, a set of requirements. So I just, you know, that, that's sort of my, my prior uh, belief. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, I think that to me the, the big sort of blind spot of Silicon Valley in particular is that the, is the idea that humans are infinitely malleable, and I just don't think they are. I think humans are unbelievably stubborn um, and uh, actually kind of resistant uh, to, being, to being shaped um, by uh, by either economic incentives or by uh, solutions that that come to us from engineering, um, and, and I think that the I think that maybe a, so. What I think is that a study of history and a study of um, philosophy could actually give us a little bit more respect for um, the stubborn resistance of, of humans to um, to having their problems solved or to being the, the subject of certain kinds of um, what we might call rational economic experiments. Yeah. Uh, my understanding of behavioral economics is limited to reading, um, thinking fast and slow, slow yep. times. Uh, so I'm trying to understand action bias clearly. Yep. One of the points that Kahneman makes is that it will be more to be lazy because the caveman had no business running around him. He was not being chased. Yep. Um, how does that with Well, so Kahneman's, um, you know, Kahneman's, uh, Kahneman's big insight, or the, the insight that really began his research, he, he calls it his eureka moment, was when he was talking to some flight instructors uh, in Israel in the late 1960s. And these flight instructors um, told him, so you can imagine Danny Kahneman, who was a, you know, um, he was a, a little guy standing there talking to these very, you know, strapping uh, Air Force, Israeli Air Force um, instructors. Uh, and, you know, the, the Air Force instructor said, look, you know, I, I want to, you know, I, I know that punishment is more effective than praise. And the, the way I know that um, is that when I have a, uh, when I have a, a, a flight cadet um, who, uh, is, um, who, who does a bad thing and I punish him, then he inevitably corrects and gets better the next time. But when I have a flight cadet who uh, is really great and I praise him, then he invariably gets, gets worse. And so Danny Kahneman's eureka moment was that actually this, um, what, what was causing the behavior was not in fact the intervention of the instructor, but mere mean regression. So in fact, typically, uh, you know, somebody does bad, then the next time maybe they do a little bit better, uh, or somebody does really well, then the next time they do a little bit worse. It had ab absolutely nothing to do with the sort of intervention of the, of the flight instructor. And in fact, this, this kind of bias is sort of well known. Um, it's, uh, so, so Sports Illustrated has long been um, the, the sort of su the subject of, of just such an illusion where if you're a really great athlete and you end up on the cover of Sports Illustrated, chances are you're gonna end up having a sort of cold streak after the fact. Well, it turns out that ending up on the cover of Sports Illustrated just happens to coincide with the, with the sort of peak of your powers. So, so the insight of behavioral economics is that people overestimate their own uh, capacity to control the situation by intervening in it, yeah, if you see what I mean. And I think from that, 
insight a lot of the, the contemporary uh, um, scene of behavioral economics has, has come. But I don't really think that we've uh, adequately absorbed it, actually. I mean, people um, love to talk about Kahneman. They love to talk about Kahneman diversity. But actually, this insight that we're sort of subject to this illusion that we can actually sort of make things happen by intervening in them is, is so profound that I don't actually think we've kind of understood it, or I don't really think that it's come um, fully into the, to the collective consciousness. Um, I think it's going to take a very long time for it to do that, uh, if it ever does. So I think that that's my answer. Um, yeah, Grayson. Yeah. And then also they like, kind of get in the way of contemplation. Yeah. Um, well, well, I mean, you, you, you're all reading the same pieces in the New York Times that I am about how uh, Silicon Valley tech executives now, now view their, their products as like tobacco and they're not giving them to their kids. I mean, what can I say? You know, I'm as addicted to my smartphone as, as anybody else. But um, uh, as a friend of mine once said, if you if you can't go more than five days without something, then you're then you're basically dependent on it. And um, I, you know, I I think smartphone dependence is a real is a real problem. I mean, what what what's your view of, of the matter? I, you know, I, I what what can I say? I mean, we're kind of hosed. I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, it would be nice if if an app could give us the capacity actually to you know. They, I mean, there are all kinds of apps for for contemplation, but. Really, it's hard to focus on the app when, when really what you want to be doing is checking your Instagram feed. I mean, I don't, I, I don't have a, an answer to that. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a big, it's a big problem. Um, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So they really, I mean, they, if we don't know ourselves, it's not their fault. Right. Um, by the time we leave. Um, but my other life um, is that I'm a minister. Ah. And what you said about, you know, kind of what you, we need to do now, our big question for this world is how do I fashion myself, um, you know, in, the, in, in this market creation. Right. <clears throat> um, as I'm just about to take a new church, start a new church in a, in a couple of weeks. And that's my question. It's funny. I hadn't preached there yet. You have to go try out, basically. Yep. And when I was done, one of the guys came up to me that owns his own business. And he's like, you know, it was good. Except you didn't tell us what to do. And I thought, um, well, I'm waiting to hear. Yeah. You know, and he keeps pushing me. And, I, and he says, what are you going to do when you first get here? I said, I'm going to listen. For the first, yes, I got to preach on Sunday. We're going to change worship. Y'all won't know, won't know what you did, But I'm going to listen to you all. Yeah. And he didn't know what to do, you know. And I think that's, um, you know, the churches in this, the Christian churches in this rummage sale, you know, period right now, where we got to throw away a lot of things and we yep. have to do things. But um, that's one of them. And the question for myself as a minister who's organizing worship is, how do I turn that time into contemplation and, and teaching people? And I did. I enter. I do a centering prayer where we have like silence, you know, and people just have to sit with. And, you know, I watch New Englanders be able to do this, which yep. is shocking, you know. Yep. But, um, but that's, that's, I think, where we are, too, is that how do we, um, you know, the history of the recent Christian church, at least, is that, okay, I'm going to fix the world, and I'm going to, you know, fix things. We're going to make it a good place to be. Yep. And I want to say to them, yeah, you still need to act, but you need to sit and listen to yourselves. You know, don't expect me as your minister to come in and tell you what to do. You all have great ideas among you. Yeah. Like, let them come out. And, and if this week I say something and you think about it and you can't figure out how to act, oh, well, come back next week yeah. and see what, you know, let's talk about it. Let's think of something, you know. And maybe it's not it. Maybe we just are for a while. And, and that some of us act and some of us be, and we've got to have the be and the acting too. So yeah. that's, I think, the struggle that... Um, that I'm facing. And yeah, and I think that's, that's a really beautiful point. I mean, the, my, my question about how do you fashion a self um, that, that seems uh, integrated and coherent in a market world has um, intentional 
echoes with a very, very old question in Christianity, which is about how to fashion a, a, a self that can be saved in a fallen world. I mean, this is my book is not, it's not a, a Christian, or it doesn't, um, it doesn't, it's, that's not the perspective of the book. But I do, th I do think that the question is similar, and I think it's a very, very ancient one, is how do, you, how do you make sense, how do you come to a sort of sense of integrity or integration uh, in a world that's asking you to, uh, to be atomized and to be autonomous? That's um, that old, of the world, of yeah. the world, but not yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, you know, that, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that we struggle with. Right, yeah, yeah and that's, that's really the question. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, the market sort of imposes certain so-called needs on us. And yep. We're saying, you know, things <clears throat> that may have been beneficial to us in our distant past are no longer. Um, so I think it's really helpful as a contemplative practice to think about the timeless things that we as human beings really need and that actually nurture us. Um, it's just very difficult to do that in our current society um, yeah. because the market is predicated on us consuming and needing things. Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of, for me at least, a way to orient my personal values and from there my actions. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I think about this, this, this question a lot in, in my teaching and I, I've come to the view that it's almost impossible to teach anybody anything, but somehow we learn in each other's presence. And so that has led me to a really belief in a kind of radical uh, democratic um, sense of what it is to teach that actually I learn, I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but it's really true. I learn way more from my students than they do from me. And, and my teaching is successful when it's, um, it's all heads together working on a problem, not me telling people what to think. And I think that that, for me, is the way out of the current predicament, is a sense of where we can find it, ritual, solidarity, connectedness, uh, co human cohesion. I mean, we, we desperately need each other, right? I mean, this is, this is, this is what we need from each other, is a sense of, of being, being together uh, and, and learning from each other, not um, each, you know, each is a separate atom. Um, so I think that that's a beautiful, it's a beautiful way of putting it. Yeah. Uh, yeah just to kind of follow up on that, um, thinking about all of these kind of wants and needs that we kind of think we have, um, and coming back to what you said about um, sort of rooting your action um, in yourself or in the mind, and when, when the mind is such a turbulent place and it's not clear what, you know, what are the real kind of wants and needs and, and um, what are the, the kind of shadows? And, um, how, how do um, these authors talk about, um, I guess, through contemplative practice? Yeah. How do they talk about um, just kind of getting in touch with what, what those genuine uh, wants and needs and values are? Yeah, I mean, so there's a... the, the um, in Buddhist thought, it's it's clear that uh, that the mind is like the sky, and thoughts are like the clouds. And part of what it is to develop a contemplative practice in in Buddhism is to be able to separate the clouds from the sky. In the tradition that I'm talking about, uh, it, that it's it's less clear what the the process is, except I think that. Um, so, so John Milton, um, a writer I revere, um, talks about coming, coming to the, the upright heart and pure. That's his ideal for what, for what a human life should be. Um, and, and for him, that's a, that's a lifelong process of actually uh, learning, learning, to, to have, um, learning to have an upright heart and pure, and learning to have a kind of, um, well, I mean, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form of, in, Integrity. Um, so I, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a clear answer except that for all of these writers, 
Uh, it's, it's a process that unfolds and unfolds and unfolds across a lifetime of just trying to, trying to, trying to know yourself. And that's really hard. It's really hard for the reasons that Kahneman talks about, is that we're sort of stuck with these incredible illusions about how things actually work. And to get, try to get behind them is actually, I think, part of the, part of the task of the con contemplative person. Um, yeah. How are we doing for time, Tia? We ha you have been generous, and what? we can end if it's time, if you like, if you want to take Why don't we take one more question, and then, then we'll end, yeah. There's two parts of this question. Yep. One is that I would invite you people to stay, just so we can properly thank Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's fine if people need to go, um, but yeah. Okay, well, why don't we, uh, um, sure, why don't we, why don't we end and let people go if they need to go, and then you and I can, you and I can talk, so thank you very much. Thank you. Great.